Okay, so, so far in discussing Reconstruction, we've talked a lot about politicians and uh, people in power and their struggle for power, but a major thing we haven't discussed, which is just a fundamental importance in this time period, is the fact that three to four million African Americans have been freed from slavery, and there are very real consequences of Reconstruction on them. Um, and the, those are things that we want to become familiar with. This is the chart that goes with this lecture. It says the effects of Reconstruction on African Americans. And you can see that at the top, we're going to be talking about the political, social, and economic changes that happened in their lives. Unfortunately, we're also going to be immediately. We're also going to be talking about at the bottom how white Southerners are going to become increasingly innovative in terms of how to uh, take back or uh, there's basically a white backlash against these gains made by African Americans. And we're going to see how those manifest themselves as well. Okay, so let's look at the um, PowerPoint here. We have immediate effects of Reconstruction on African Americans. All right, the first thing involves politics, and for the first time I've made what you really need to write bigger than um, the other text on the slide, but the most important thing is that African Americans could suddenly vote black males, and you can see here in this picture we see um, black a black male voting uh, a, re, a radical Republican kind of uh, shepherding that process and these Confederates and Andrew Johnson looking bitterly um, on about this. And um, so Republicans are basically going to dominate Southern governments. About 90% of qualified black men are going to vote. There's a very high rate of participation in voting among former slaves, um, though a lot of times they were criticized for not necessarily having an advanced education um, about voting and candidates and those kinds of things, but being somewhat manipulated sometimes by, by Republicans. But they voted nonetheless, and that was an important gain, and one that they chose to exercise in great numbers. Also, because so many African Americans were voting and fewer confed former Confederates could vote, um, we get our first African American elected officials. Um, Hiram Rebels, Rebels from Mississippi was the first black senator elected to the U.S. Senate, and there will be others. Um, and so that's, it's odd, for a short period of time in Reconstruction, there are African Americans elected to public office, and then as white supremacy reestablishes itself, we see that basically disappear until after the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. Um, here's an example of a political cartoon during this time period where you can see a, a very happy African-American uh, kind of put forth in racial kind of stereotypes, very happy with his vote, and a um, very kind of bitter, embittered uh, Confederate CSA veteran who um, has not been given the right to vote. Um, here's another um, political cartoon that has a tinge of racial stereotyping and white, white supremacy um, ideas to it. This shows supposedly the uh, South Carolina legislature when it was under majority rule. Um, you can see here that the white cartoonist has portrayed South Carolina as being, its legislature as being ruled by African Americans um, who are unfit for office, who seem to be doing a lot of arguing and um, inappropriate things but don't seem to um, be getting a lot done as a, as a white male looks on here in astonishment. So these are some of the contemporary representations of quote-unquote black rule during the time period. Socially, African Americans have just an absolute revolution in their um, lives. Many of them are able, who have, uh, have youth on their side or uh, those things, are able to travel about the country and try and reunite their families. Sometimes this worked out beautifully, sometimes it did not. If you remember, slaves uh, who had quote-unquote married during slavery times, their, um, their marriages weren't really recognized by government or legalized, and they were, a lot of times it was understood that when they were sold into another part of the country from their wife or husband that their, their marriages were basically dissolved. So a lot of times people would try and reunite with their family members or loved ones and find that they had already uh, established other households. So this is very tumultuous, as you can imagine, quite would make for quite the reality TV series in uh, modern times, um, that's for sure. And then um, a lot of them, for the first time, were able to establish their own churches down here. For the first time, we get like the African Methodist Episcopal churches that had only been in the north, suddenly are able to come down to the south. And ministers and churches really become the leaders of black communities, and black communities also become centered around the church. The church becomes the kind of main cultural center in many communities. Um, schools are established to help educate free pe people of all ages. And um, you really get just children from the age of 8 to 80 all crammed in the same classrooms trying to learn the most basic skills of literacy and mathematics. And a lot of uh, white teachers 
who meant well wanted to come down and help teach those those African American students, and so there was a real push for uh, education. Um, the population of the South's ten largest cities are going to double. A lot of African Americans who leave the plantations are going to go to the cities where they perceive that there'll be more opportunities and more um, social interaction and those kinds of things. So the whole um, degree of urbanization of the South shifts during this time period thanks to uh, that population shift. Economically, um, slaves during the Civil War period had had a lot of hope that somehow there might be some radical redistribution of land as a result of the war. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman had promised at some point that um, they would be given 40 acres of land and a mule, um, but he was uh, corrected later and it never happened on a large scale to any significant degree. And so what we're really going to see is that African Americans emerge economically very vulnerable. They have the labor of their backs, but they have no land. And the Supreme Court is going to rule that um, while whites might dominate the land, that there can be no mass redistribution of land. That, In fact, while white Southerners, um, that white Southerners owned their land and there was no due process established by which you could take land from people and redistribute it to other people. So... Um, there was a decision made that there would be no land redistribution at all. And so all the, all the freed slaves really have is their labor, and all the white Southerners have is land. And so suddenly there's a question of, well, where are these two groups going to meet together um, so that each of them can prosper? And um, so white Southerners come up with a system, and the system is called sharecropping. Um, sharecropping and tenant farming, uh, neither of which necessarily were great, um, were great, benefit to African Americans because they were very prone to be conned uh, through this system. What happens in sharecropping is a landowner will take his land and divide it into plots and he gives the freed slave or the poor white some acres to work. And um, if they really have nothing, he'll give them the, the tools and the seed also to plant the crop. So the, um, the sharecropper is simply responsible, simply as if that were easy, is responsible for all the kind of sweat equity but not any of the material goods that go into the land. At harvest, then, the worker is supposed to give a share of his crop, about half, to the planter. But you can see where, if you're a sharecropper, you, this is all fraught with problems. First of all, you probably don't have great education, and um, therefore, on weighing day, when all the figures are being worked out, um, you're very prone to be ripped off. And there's a power differential there, too, where you really can't, question. A black freedman really doesn't feel safe questioning uh, what a white man has said about how much things weigh or what who owes who what amount of money. So a lot of times these freed slaves and poor whites were really at the mercy of their uh, landowner to cut them a fair deal and um, that wasn't always to their advantage. Also, um, the other problem is that a lot of times these sharecroppers might have problems with their crop. There could be a, a boll weevil crisis as uh, broke out in the cotton markets, or a, a hailstorm that ruins the tobacco crop, or uh, any number of, a, a drought. And what that does is put the sharecropper into debt, and so the next year they might owe their whole crop to the landowner. Well then, they, they still need to feed their families, and so they're going to need to borrow more money from the landowner, or maybe shop at the landowner's general store. A lot of these landowners established um, general stores on their property. And you can imagine that if you can only shop at one store, and that's the one run by your landowner, that maybe the prices aren't that good, and they would run up huge credit accounts that would never be paid off, and those debts would be passed on to their children if they didn't settle the debt before their death. So suddenly you get this kind of intergenerational debt that really makes the sharecroppers economic slaves, if not political slaves. So really, sharecropping kind of places freed slaves back into a slave-like condition where they're really bound to a landowner and can't really leave um, uh, on their own uh, free will. So that is sharecropping. Uh, a little step up from that, so it's hard to get out of poverty, it's what we call a cycle of, of debt and poverty that, resists, that exists as a result of this. A little bit better than that is tenant farming. In tenant farming, you just go ahead and pay cash for renting the land, and therefore you keep 100% of your own crop. So if you could tenant farm, you were more likely to get out of poverty because you didn't get indebted. But there weren't a lot of people who had that cash up front to be tenant farmers. 
but so it's kind of a hierarchy in the South. The sharecroppers at the bottom of the barrel, tenant farmers are one step up, and then of course landowners are at the top of the, the social hierarchy. Okay, so um, just remember that the economic conditions of the post-war South, um, what were the, most of the Southern state governments were led by Republicans, and they were led by Republicans because the black um, men could vote and many white men in the South could not. And um, be sure you know what the 40 acres and a mule idea is and um, why it was necessary, but uh, why it didn't work, and um, what sharecropping and tenant farming are um, as poor substitutes for any significant land reform or uh, realignment of um, economic power in the South during this time period. Okay, that's it. Not too bad. 1037. I'll take it. Bye.